we should get started. Uh, three o'clock here in Kyoto. Welcome everyone to the um, Kyoto University's uh, Global uh, Glasgow School of Education uh, Global Education Office webinar series, uh, which is called the Rethinking Japanese Model of Education Through an East Asian Dialogue. Uh, my name is Keita Takayama. I'm the director of the office, and this is the third of our 2021 seminar series. So uh, today's uh, presenter, um, Associate Professor Yan Pin Fan, uh, National Institute of Education in Singapore, and Assistant Professor Lee Fan Won, uh, Hukui University in Japan. Uh, they are going to talk about uh, Japanese school's staff room, Shokuinshitsu uh, in Japanese. As many of you know, Shokuinshitsu uh, is where all the teachers in a school have their desks together. It is where they spend most of the time outside of their instructional hours. And it is where teachers talk to each other, work together and make decisions about schools. It is where students feel a bit intimidated as if they're not supposed to be there. That's at least how I felt when I was growing up. It is a very ordinary a part of Japanese schooling with which uh, people in Japan are very familiar. It is something you, you'd expect to see as you walk into any Japanese schools, a primary and middle schools. So much so that we don't even ask why it's there and what it is for. But if you know anything about schools in other countries, you know that not all countries have shoku institute or something equivalent. In the United States and Australia, for example, the two countries that I'm very familiar with, they do not have anything that is even remotely resembling Japanese shokuinshitsu. The schools in these countries have a staff room, but the room is there for teachers to go in and have morning afternoon tea or lunch during the recess. The room is mostly, most likely equipped with sofa, a tables, a TV set, and a microwaves, but certainly not with work desks where teachers do their teaching preparation. In fact, uh, teachers are not supposed to stay there for too long. Once the recess is over, they are to be back in their own classrooms. So we begin to see how unique is Shoku Institute might be only when we take an international comparative perspective. So Shoku Institute has attracted the attention of international scholars outside Japan as one of the interesting features of Japanese schools. But the problem has been that those international scholars are by and large American or British scholars, mostly American. Uh, this suggests that the particular features of Shoku Institute have been identified, identified through the eyes of those who come from education systems where nothing like Shoku Institute exists. One could argue that this has resulted in a particular representation of an interpretation of Shoku Institute that is reflective of, of the particular experience of American or a British school. And this is a common problem of the international scholarly representation of Japanese education. That is, Japanese education has been represented through the problematic practice of what Quan Xin Chen, a Taiwanese cultural studies scholar, what he calls West as method. That is the articulation of Japanese uniqueness through incessant comparisons with what is putatively Western, American, or British. And this is the very problem that the presenters today are going to try to overcome in their discussion and analysis of Shoku Institute. They're going to try to reposition the discussion of Shoku Institute within the East Asian uh, regional framing. What different interpretations might emerge if we move away from West as a method and adopt 
the regional framing with East Asia as a point of reference. What new insights about Japanese education might emerge as a result? How will it help us to rethink our self-perception of Japanese schools within Japan? But of course, shifting the frame itself might be easier to say than actually to do it. What challenges do we anticipate? And what resources do we need to achieve this goal? And what relationship, what partnership, and what networks do we need? And most importantly, with whom? What does the enormity of challenge suggest about the way in which we have been trained as an education scholar? And I'm hoping that the Yab Bin Ali Fan will be able to engage with some of these questions today. I have known Yampin and Li Fan for some time. In late 2020, uh, I was approached by East China Normal University in Shanghai, China. They invited me to edit a special issue for their English language journal, uh, East China Normal U Review of Education, which they launched a few years earlier. In response, along with Professor Yu Min Li at Hongik University, South Korea, I prepare a call, call for expression of interest uh, titled Education Research in, for, from East Asia. And I am Bin Li Fan are the two of the 14 people who expressed interest in being part of the special issue. The participants are mostly East Asian scholars based in US, Japan, Singapore, China, and Korea though some of us are not necessarily a citizen of these countries. And since then, we as a group have met six times online, sharing initial writing ideas and collectively working out the focus, specific focus of the special issue. As a group, we have tried to create a network of East Asian education scholars. And through this supportive network, we try to help each other to achieve the kind of decisive shift in our framing of research from West as method to East Asia as method. So what Yampin and Lifan are going to present today will be informed by the ongoing discussion at this group. Yampin Fan is an associate professor at the National Institute of Education, Singapore. She obtained her PhD in curriculum a teaching and education policy from Michigan State University in 2005. And before her PhD, Yang Pin had worked at the Shanghai Academy of Education Sciences as a researcher for eight years and was involved in China UNICEF sponsored research and teacher development initiatives. She is currently a principal investigator of NRE National Institute of Education Center for Research in Pedagogy and Practice research projects on lesson study and mathematical problem solving in Singapore classrooms. Lee Fan uh, Wang is an assistant professor at the National Institute for School Teachers and Staff Development, Fukui University, Japan. After completing a PhD in education at the University of Tokyo, she has been involved in multiple international projects using, using Japanese lesson study for professional development of teachers from developing countries. So please join me to welcome Yampin and Li Fan. Over to you guys. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Kita. Um, it's an honor to be here. And this preparation really is honored to actually indebted to Professor Kita's invitation. And this invitation made a transition for us in search of a re new research identity. So let me uh, share a screen of our talk. talk. Uh, thank you for your patience because this talk is given by two people, Lin Fen and I, we shared the parts. And we would like to start uh, with who we are researchers. Lin Fen and I, we got to know each other since Lin Fen's doctoral studies in Tokyo University when I attended lesson study conference in Japan, in Tokyo. 
And we are connected through introducing Japanese lesson study to Singapore and elsewhere through our publications and research. We are further connected more recently through staff room research. Let me give you an overview of our talk. We will start with a brief context of why Japanese staff room. And we will start also with why we are moving towards East Asia as a method by focusing on Japanese staff room. Then I'll pass to uh, Lin Feng, who will talk about staff room as role's responsibilities in a three-dimensional world of space, time, and tool-mediated interactions. Then I'll continue to examine staff room as strategic boundary making and boundary crossing in understanding the fluidity observed in performing of roles and responsibilities. Connected with boundary making and boundary crossing, actually what's happening in staff rooms, constantly expensive learning happening. And also third space build momentarily for meaning making. So we'll end with discussion and conclusion. So everything started exactly 20 years ago in 2002 in a doctoral program in College of Education, Michigan State University. When we attended a seminar class on teacher learning. Our course readings, mostly written by American scholars, were about teacher individualism, challenges to collegiality, so different from teachers working together as a norm in our own cultures, all the cultures we are familiar with. Four young ladies attending the course challenged ourselves by posing the topic of studying teachers working together in staff rooms as sites for teacher learning as a course research project. In 2002, in December, Four of us, we ventured back to Shanghai, a West you know, city in Japan, and also in, in uh, Seoul, Korea. So you can see from the pictures, in fact, central staff rooms with all teachers working together are shared by career schools, Korean schools and Japanese schools. The Shanghai staff rooms in schools, they're much smaller. They're located on different floor spaces of the building. What's common is that teachers always work together. The next year, we published a conference paper called Rose in Context examining staff rooms as sites for teacher learning in three cultures, China, Japan, and South Korea. And we presented the conference paper at both AERA and CIES as the doctoral students. If you look at the uh, screen, you can see all of the lenses, all of the lenses and researchers we quoted, they are well-known American scholars looking at teacher isolation like Dan Lotte, Huberman, Do This Little, and Contrived Collegiality by Hargreaves and other authors. So viewing from Western lenses, we answered our research questions really without much understanding of how and why teachers learn in staff rooms in East Asia. We answered the questions teachers work together so they learn together, but we do not understand how and why. We do not understand our own cultures in a world. It was last year when we met Professor Kita, who introduced us to his small community of East Asia scholars. And together, we continued pursuing our passion for understanding our social cultural practices 
of education. Enlightened by Wang's well-known work of Asia as method, we are in search of an East Asia as method to reconnect with our shared cultural practices, including staff room practices, by generating new ways of understanding and finding new researcher identity. In doing so, we found ourselves broken away from the shackles of a certain set of Western dominated lenses to re-examine teacher staff rooms with a set of new lenses. And particularly in this webinar, we are focusing on a central staff room in Fukui, Japan, observed by Dr. Ling Feng Wang. We view a Japanese staff room as an activity system with clearly norms, cultures, tools and resources, with people working together to turn the object of educational goals into student learning, student well-being. And this activity system is situated now in a three-dimensional space with time, the historicity space, the setting, and the three-dimensional, and also the two mediated interactions. We use boundary making and boundary crossing as central lens to view how roles and responsibilities are performed fluidly because this pair of lenses, they're able to explain why in staff rooms, the roles, can, the roles are performed very fluidly with expensive learning and a third space created for meaning making. We also explore historical and cultural values behind the staff room practices we study. So now I turn to Lin Feng, who's going to start with a day in the staff room as an ethnographer research. From distributed situated workplace learning environment, a three dimensional view. Well, I'm going to guide you to uh, take a look at this uh, staff room for this uh, study. I went to this school on a random day uh, 9th of October, 2019, it was a Wednesday. So I've been to this school uh, before to attend their open research meetings for a couple of times. But on that day, it was also my first time to enter to the staff room and spend my whole day there because all these open research meetings, it was held at the classrooms and also the meeting rooms. So it was also new for me uh, to stay as observer of the staff room for the first time. At the uh, beginning of the day, the vice uh, principal introduced me to the whole staff and uh, explained this uh, study was about a comparative study uh, of the staff room in uh, different countries. And this school uh, was selected to represent a typical uh, junior high school in, in Japan. So I also uh, added, uh, like I would uh, act like a transparent uh, uh, person, Tomeningen, so to not interrupt uh, teacher's work. Uh, this is the uh, building floor of the, uh, um, the, the junior high school. You could tell it's a, a large size junior high school in the, in the city. Uh, they have eight classes in one grade, have more than 750 students with uh, 45 subject teachers. And the staff room is located at the first floor uh, of the whole building. I would also like to invite you to, uh, to introduce the teacher M. Uh, teacher M is an in-service uh, teacher, and he, she was enrolled in the MED program at my university. And that's why uh, I started to uh, get involved with the school. And she is, was the research leader at that time uh, with the 
uh, more than 25 years of teaching experiences. And uh, uh, this school was her uh, seventh uh, school, and it's uh, her third year in this school. And this uh, teacher, Anne, I interviewed uh, her and asked, uh, what this stuff room to you? And uh, she answered, it's an uh, information sharing place, both privately and for working purpose, and also a relaxing place uh, to drink coffee and to, to eat snacks. Her answer actually shows the function, the main function of the staff room, which are also can be confirmed uh, from the previous literature review. This is the timeline of a, a day of a teacher M. Uh, the first period starts at uh, 8.45, but she came to school at 6.50. Was, uh, she was on duty uh, to greet all students at the school gate, the greeting campaign, have the duty of the homeroom teacher, also attended the, the morning staff assembly and the grade level uh, debriefing meeting. So then it's the teaching time after teaching. She also hosted, as a research leader, she also hosted the research meeting at the end of the day because it was a random Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday is uh, considered as a no dangyo day in the city. And all the teachers were asked to, to, to leave the school uh, around 6.30. So this photo shows the desk of uh, teacher M. So we could tell there are uh, not much things exhibited on the desk. From the first slide, I couldn't even tell uh, the subject because there were no textbooks or related uh, information on the desk. But if you zoom in and get more information, and we can read a lot of things from a teacher's desk. So when I asked her, how do you see the relationship and the differences between a classroom and a staff room, and the teacher M said, classroom is my own word because she's a homeroom teacher. I uh, have a freedom in making posters, how to decorate the classroom, and how to decide the routine activities, and how to show it to other teachers, and how to create a system to let other teachers and the students know the class and the classroom. Uh, but the staff room is a, a formal for exchanging information and also for relax. So this is also identified the, the function of the staff room in the eye of a, a teacher. So all the data were uh, taken uh, before the teaching, during the teaching, and after the teaching in the staff room. These two photos shows the general image of the staff room, and one from the front, one from the back. And you can tell this is my spot, my seat uh, on that day, and has the perfect angle to scan through all the staff room. Now we're uh, about the data collection. Uh, we've taken uh, photos, uh, filmed some uh, meetings happening at, uh, in the staff room. Well, I was uh, observing the staff room during the teaching time. I'm also writing, I was also writing a field note. I mainly interviewed teacher M. We also, I also had the small talks with other two teachers uh, during the day. And I also attended the research meeting together with the teachers. So uh, this is the floor map of the staff room. I assume uh, most of you know uh, what a staff room looks like in Japan, but I'm showing this for uh, our international audience who may haven't uh, been to a Japanese school yet. So you can see the first arrow is the uh, 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 entry. Uh, once you enter the staff room, you have the whole view of the staff room at the, your first site. You can also see the other arrow uh, directing to the left side. That's the door to the uh, principal's uh, office. And the, there, there is a door, but the door is open for the whole day. We can divide this staff room into five main zones. This red zone is for administrators, including vice principal, uh, head of curriculum, vice head of curriculum, and administrative clerk at that front zone. And this is the yellow zone, is the grade one teacher zone, grade two teacher zone, and the zone of grade three. And we also identified another fifth zone here at the side, 
It's a, a zone five. It uh, has seats for part-time teachers, for supporting uh, staffs who may not work every day here, and also have the area for reception. Has sofa there, so the teachers can have meetings with outsiders when there was issues need to be discussed. So to show you the space of the whole staff room, we would like to invite you to take a, a look at the walls. The four walls, which are the main uh, information sharing and posting of places in the staff room. The front, uh, back, side left, and side uh, right was. We are going to zoom in to find out what are exhibited around that was and what information it sent to the teachers and how it connects to teachers' roles and responsibilities. So let's take a look at the front wall. We could tell this Blackboard shows the student attendance. And uh, I see this front wall as a central uh, control panel for the whole school. It shows all the information needs to be known for everyone in the staff room. And the uh, second part shows all the timetables and schedules and uh, how the rooms were used and uh, what are the main information need to share among teachers. And the third part, if you look at it uh, carefully, we could say the above ones shows the teachers on duty for today, the admin, the management uh, teachers on duty. And we could also say the two-day schedule for teachers and the teacher's attendance. In the two schedules, in addition to what will happen today as school activities and events, it will also have the meeting schedules for teachers who will go to where to have a uh, meeting and uh, they could expect them to give a, a debriefing when they come back. So this is the front wall showing this uh, information to all of the uh, teachers in the staff room at the very uh, front uh, wall. So this is the side left wall and uh, that is the en uh, entrance. Once you get in, you could say there is a pin board there are notices and uh, postings and information shared from outside. Uh, there were uh, open research meetings at the neighborhood uh, school. There were uh, seminar informations from the public city hall. And the red part also is the cabinet, but there are also information about schools uh, posting there, including the school plan, uh, uh, clinic map, and safety map. And the green one shows the, the whiteboard for the two-day uh, student schedule. And the pink one shows the uh, timetable and schedule of the club activities at weekends and vacation times. And this is the uh, specific example of the, how the two-day two schedule showed on the, on the whiteboard for students to copy into uh, their classroom whiteboard uh, later. We could say it has a two-day schedule here, but also have other uh, side postings and bottom postings uh, to keep telling the time and schedule, the weekly, a daily, and the uh, monthly activities. So this is the back wall. It's near to the grade three area. Uh, we could tell the school models were re, uh, uh, the frames on, on the wall. And we could also see the whiteboard showing the two-day schedule for grade three students. And on the blackboard, there are many papers, uh, postings there. It also included all the information, mainly the schedule, timetable, teacher's duty, and uh, uh, other information need to be shared at the, uh, the back wall area. So if we look at the four walls, all of them share something in common. So information, the timetable schedules, and the teacher duty list are distributed all around the four walls. Uh, some of them are more than one time uh, to achieve the uh, mutual common understandings among teachers. At the meantime, it also helps uh, to support the teachers performing of their roles and responsibilities. So we divide, uh, we've made this pie chart to show the percentages of the information we could tell uh, most of them are timetables, schedules, informations, and teacher duties. And this uh, also identified the main functions of the staff room and how the teachers are using the staff room environment to connect to their uh, task performing. 
So after the wars, let's take a look at the desk. I say desk to tell stories about the teacher, about the school, uh, half drink coffee on the table, newly distributed timetables for the next week, uh, a drawer uh, open and uh, papers uh, scattered waiting for being filed. Laptop is on, the video camera with tripod was there and the backpack with all the teaching materials in the basket was uh, on the floor. All this tells what was happening earlier, what, has, what is happening now and what are going to be happen when the teacher come back. There are many uh, space for us to assume and uh, to expect what is happening during this space at the current time. These are the four categories of the things we could uh, identify from the teacher's desks. So let's uh, take a look at each category to show you examples of uh, what were they. So this uh, shows the timetables and pictures pressed uh, under uh, the transparent plastic sheet on each desk. Uh, the left uh, photo shows the monthly calendar, uh, teacher's duty calendar for the semester, and also the teaching uh, workload for, for a teacher. And the other uh, uh, right photo also, should, we could say there were personal photos and even the postcards received from a, a former colleague uh, was uh, uh, showing under their desk. It tells what the uh, a teacher's identity and what they value and what they want to have in their uh, personal space at the desk. We could also find the, uh, the books and files and folders among all the uh, teacher's desks. And one main feature is that most of them are files. And all those files are named after a teacher's duties. For example, the grade level meetings, the organizing events, a moral education, uh, life guidance. We could see the teachers filed them and named them according to their duties and responsibility in the school. And uh, this, uh, this is the uh, student's report card. And this is the uh, staff meeting agenda for tomorrow. And this is the photo showing the newly distributed uh, weekly uh, calendar and also the things they prepared the handouts to, to go to, to, to the students. All these things are on the surface of the desks, which means they are, it's, it's teachers' immediate tasks they need to uh, handle and to deal with. And all these things actually related and connected to the uh, monthly calendar because it's the uh, end of the semester. That's why they need to fill and prepare for the student report card. And the, the next day's meetings agenda was distributed on all their days. And uh, we could say all things are connected with, with the uh, school reason. We also find uh, there was a laptop on each teacher's desk. It was uh, provided by the Board of Education around 14 years ago. We could, these are the moments we captured what our teacher is using laptop. Uh, one teacher is uh, uh, writing his lesson plan because he's going to open his lesson uh, for the coming weeks for uh, school visits from the Board of Education. We could say this teacher is trying to, in, uh, to put in uh, the student's report card uh, from the Excels, and this teacher is uh, inputting the question, student questionnaires about the school uh, life uh, evaluation at the end of the uh, semester. And the other teacher is uh, putting student entry for the upcoming uh, sports meetings. All these things connected to the monthly calendar of the school. These are the things need to be prepared at this moment and also for the continuous weeks. So uh, we've, uh, the time schedule popped to our eyes because everything is related to it. And this uh, pink sheet shows the monthly activity and uh, study calendar. And we could tell there was first meeting going on and there were uh, school visits from the Board of Education uh, going on. And all these things reflected to the weekly calendars. And this is the week, weekly schedule for this week. We could tell I went there on uh, day nine and the next day is the end uh, of, the class, of the teaching of this semester. And we also have the uh, weekly uh, schedule for the next day and also for the, the week 
of when the uh, Board of Education supervisor are going to visit this school. So all these timetables and schedules linked uh, very closely to what teachers uh, working are and what they are uh, handling with all those uh, tools, the forms on their desk. So the walls, the desk, and all the time schedules all linked together. So at the uh, last slide, I would like to show you, this is one teacher's uh, teaching uh, loads for one week. We could tell there were 23 hours there. And we have to also consider each teacher's roles on their school duties. Each school uh, on average has more than three duties according to the school research organizational system. So there are four the yellow categories, lesson study group, belonging and the bonding building group, team cultivating group, and the community collaboration group. All the teachers are divided into one of these four uh, groups. So they are in charge of a different uh, school duties and they have to also have to cover that part of work. And uh, no wonder uh, our teachers are overworking every day, but these schedules and this uh, uh, and their duties are so integrated together and we could uh, read so much from the staff room. So these are the uh, brief introduction of the raw data uh, we, we collected. And now Dr. Fang is going to uh, do a data analysis uh, using our uh, research framework. Part three, I'm going to show that staff room from the ethnographer researchers lens, how it will be viewed as an activity system. You see with the, how the space are used, how the artifacts collected serve as tools of information, roles distribution, and also the functions of each zooms, five zooms of the staff room. They're very carefully uh, designed to facilitate the performing of roles and duties. To start with, let's look at the key, in the section here, let's look at the key uh, definitions of the terms. The activity system we'll see, they are the educational activities where they're conducted through sharing clearly defined roles and responsibilities, guided by social cultural rules and norms. We look at the boundaries. There are visible boundaries, physical, meaning teachers, they can walk to each other, you know, they can walk to anywhere in the staff room, in the five, across the five bounds, five zones. These are the boundaries visible, but there are also boundaries that invisible, like meetings, morning meetings, end of the day meetings, lesson study preparation meetings, observation of open research lessons. So we argue when boundaries are made by assigning and defining unique and distinctive roles through clear boundaries of tasks and ordering resources to support their execution, but we also find these boundaries in the staff room actually across very fluidly, performing and completing the roles and tasks assisted by tools, resources in which time, duties, all the responsibilities spelled out very clearly and communicated again and again through meetings as well. So in this sense, we're arguing the fluidity is actually something like a coin. One side of the coin, you define the boundaries. The other side is to strategically support how to cross the boundaries. So we see there are two kinds of boundaries. One is the visible boundary of the five zones and seat arrangement, as well as the strategies in deploying you know, the physical arrangements. And the next one is 
very invisible boundaries, particularly we examine, there are many inv invisible boundaries, but for our analysis or on that very day, they focus on daily meetings. And in the end, you will see we focus on two meetings. As Ling Feng, this is Ling Feng as an architecture designer who marvelously, you know, draw this diagram for us. I use this diagram to show that you can see crowded, very crowded looking is the clock, is the staff room, but passages, aisles are designed around all the five zones to allow everyone to reach each corner of the staff room without much physical barrier to access a facility or to talk to a colleague. Each of the five zones has its distinctive boundaries of functions, roles and duties, but they are easily crossed for communication of information, seeking for help to facilitate the role performance. So I'm going to show a few kinds of visible role performance captured in the photos Ling Feng took on that day. The physical movement by English teachers in the above picture, because they are not seated together. So one is traveling, moving to consult another English teacher at his desk. The second picture below it, you can see there are two uh, teachers from other countries teaching English and strategically their desks are put together. So physically, you know, it's very convenient for them to talk to each other. And you can see there is also the strat strategic deployment of subject teachers to cross the boundary of grade levels. One of it is Tademochi, teacher Y interviewed by Ling Feng shared. We teach one class in grade one, one class in grade two, and one class in grade three. We call this Tademochi. You can see this science teacher who is actually in the picture, who's actually reading textbooks of different grade levels. He gets a systematic understanding of science content across the three grade levels, while still able to obtain a more rounded understanding of students' academic learning and behaviors from teachers of different subjects in the same grade level, Zoom. So you can see the grade level Zoom actually provided other lenses, other eyes, sources of information, years for him to get to know his students in a more rounded way in academic performance across different subject areas and even more education, for instance. So this also necessitates necessitates a weekly subject-based staff meeting to coordinate content and pacing in a certain content across grade levels. So in some schools in Japan now, they actually have another space for subject teachers to stay. Some of them, they stay longer even in that subject-based space. So next, we can also see the grade levels can also be, the boundaries can also be crossed between grade levels through meetings. It's very interesting for outsiders who look at Japanese staff room, fascinated. You know, there is in the morning, after the whole school's morning meeting, there is a very short concurrent grade level meetings. Grade level one and grade level two, they actually met very shortly, less than five minutes. You can see grid level, you know, one, the teach the grid level head in red, the lady that I circled is organizing grid level one meeting, concurrently the young gentleman, the young teacher, the grid level two head 
is actually chairing the grade level two meetings. So it's amazing how mindful the teachers need to be to not to overhear, but to really focus their attention on their own meetings, referring to documents in their hands. And the next picture below it, after the meeting sometime in the day, the, act, the two grade level heads, they were checking with each other on the activities to coordinate the activities after the grade level meetings across the two grade level, grade levels. And we can also see the kind of movement, the space, you know, it's across the whole staff room, the principal, the senior gentleman walked through the neighboring office, through the side door leading directly to the office space to talk, to pass a document to grade level one head. And we also see on the right, the young teacher, there's a math teacher, the female young math teacher is seeking advice from the vice principal. The vice principal, we can't see, you know, like uh, it, it's, it's sitting, you know, the lowered uh, talking with this young math teacher. And the role played by the VP is multiple. We look at a few notes, we see multiple roles played by the vice principal. Here is more like role of a mentor teacher when the mentor teacher is not in the room. And we also see here, in a great level, the physical boundaries between the novice teacher, the beginning teacher and the experienced teacher are crossed. Every staff room has employed one very experienced teacher as a mentor teacher, a fixed desk for the mentor teacher. The novice teacher in the beginning, in the morning, before the, every, everything starts, she was actually consulting the mentor teacher to get a calendar. They want, they shared open calendar in another photo. They want to find time to consult to, for the novice to consult the mentor teacher. And seat arrangements purposefully mixed with the beginning or young teachers, with senior teachers to facilitate their, facilitate their socialization and the interaction and the sharing of knowledge and experience. So we can also see the boundaries of the grade level teachers in the grade level Zooms and their classrooms are crossed every day through the sharing of the two day schedule of tasks. Ling Feng has already shown us just now with you know, each grade level, they have this whiteboard student come to copy and move the two day duties to the classroom. So the activities of teachers and students, they're coordinated and running parallel, fully informed. And we see another space boundary crossing, which Ling Feng shared, is more like telling us stories. Like on the desks, you know, when uh, teacher M shared, that they have their personal belongings on the desk to rest and eat snacks. So you can see it's a public space. You can hear everything around. You have meetings here. You have students coming in, but it's also a private space. You rest, eat snacks. So we see all these boundaries behind. What is behind this visible boundary making? Indeed, the above pictures capture interactions by crossing physical boundaries, but far beyond mere physical crossing, a purposeful architectural design, strategic use of space and artifacts and manpower deployment to facilitate smooth performance of roles and responsibilities. These interactions facilitate instantaneous communication timely information sharing, getting every staff connected in a network of information and well connected with students. They break down the administrative bureaucracies and make the school running more seemingly democratic. 
So local researchers, one of them, Sato's research, one of them is very representative. Sato's work is representative of staff room research, even though staff room research is still quite limited according to our research uh, literature review. So Sato's study through interviews found these five dimensions of you know, the functions of the staff room, confirming what we've got. You know, the exchange information about children, including surplus of information, so much information, overflow of information, to achieve mutual understanding among teachers through communication to provide mentoring communication plays to educate teachers through experienced senior teacher guidance, to create inheritors of teaching culture through mentoring and negotiation, and to provide a place for teachers to rest. Sato's research in the following two years through teacher narratives also find that teacher space there is an organizational flexibility and it's a place for children to come to seek teacher out for information, but can be also a place students are called to the office, being reprimanded, being disciplined. We saw photos of that day too. And there are also time when students coming in, in the cleaning, after lunch cleaning, in the afternoon school cleaning time to help teachers clean the staff room. So how wonderful, you know, students are learning reciprocally returning the service of teachers in gratitude. And space also provide teachers direct guidance, observation of colleagues beyond information, exchange information that they cannot share with students. So uh, next, after you see all the interactions we captured from photos, which are visible if you at that moment were also in the staff room, but there are invisible boundary crossing in meetings. Against visible boundaries, these invisible ones, particular meetings, and privately private lived experiences, they are actually formed, built all the time, momentarily, in, instantaneously. And for this webinar, we share two meetings. The less than four minute morning staff meeting at around 8 a.m. and late afternoon one and a half staff meeting started at 6.13 when all children were dismissed earlier on that day as shared by Ling Feng. So these invisible ones in the morning staff meeting, first the attention was called by the afternoon staff research meeting by both head of curriculum and head of teaching research, Madame M. Madame M, Ling Feng also re uh, introduced. So to prepare teachers in the afternoon, for the Board of Education BOE supervisor visit, which I will share next. So after that, the meeting focused on students. Students volunteered, 35 of them needed to help local district community festival. So the school, one of the school responsibility is to serve the community. So students also, the announcement also made students still come late even though it's the last day of this, you know, this semester, we still want students to come on time, not to rush all the time, to be disciplined and cultivate the habit of being punctual. So that's one thing. And they also shared one student broke a window with a broom during the cleaning hour the day before. The brief meeting ends with announcing the teacher researcher Wang Sun's whole day visit to the school. This kind of very brief early morning meetings is orientation ritual of the day, as usually they are followed strategically by a 10 minute homeroom teachers returning right away to their morning class meetings. And they relate 
the information announced as well as at their own classroom announcements to the students. The two meetings keep the school administrators, teachers, students coordinated to start the day with clear school expectations of the roles and responsibilities of the day, to address the problems of students' discipline, to offer voluntary service to co local community and get ready for visitor as well as late afternoon school meeting, school research meeting. So the second one is looking at the meeting in the afternoon, the research staff meeting started 4.30 in the afternoon. In the afternoon, the principal briefly addressed the staff about the national curriculum reform for deep learning. Then the teaching research head, teacher M, chaired a large part of the meeting to prepare the staff for the BOE visit. Going through the document very carefully, she prepared and distributed earlier. She grouped teachers by subjects and by res open research lessons to be observed by the supervisor from BOE and nominated moderators. And then she asked social studies teacher and moral, lesson, moral education teacher to share the two open research lessons planned. Social study teacher's lesson on organ donation and moral education teacher's lesson on apologies or not, they both promote critical thinking based on values clarification to foster deep learning. And the social study teacher and moral education teacher both shared their planning lesson plans for open research lessons and they distributed their lesson plans to teachers' desks before the meeting in which one column this is for teachers to fill out their feedback. This is actually when we do lesson study, we all use lesson plan for research lessons for multiple purposes, for visitors, for observers. So feedback would be conveniently, you know, referred to uh, by the teachers for improvement. So this kind of feedback giving and the utilizing for improvement created a third space between teachers of the staff room and open research lesson teacher himself or herself, as well as the teachers from outside of schools. For instance, on the BOE visit day, which is 23rd of October, the third space will be expanded and further expanded when all teachers from other schools those who are available coming to observe open research lessons. And the two research lessons offered will be visited by the BOE supervisor. So we can see that through such network of information gathering and the learning, the larger goals of the national curriculum reform for deep learning will be coordinated across schools, across teachers. So we talk about 15 minutes. This section, we focus on what after boundary crossing, boundary making and boundary crossing. They are this expensive learning and search space. What is expensive learning? Broadly, Armstrong would view they are from moving from fragmented to fuller understanding, from concrete to abstract, from practice to theory. And for the schools, we all know across, across the globe, across the world, there is this spiral expansion of the curriculum, unit by unit across grade and prepared and deliberated in Japan in the staff room, seeing students accumulate knowledge and skills, cultivation of character and attitudes. These are typical expensive learning schools. 
in accomplishing school's educational missions. These teachers also accumulate knowledge and experience of education alongside. In studying a teacher's Japanese staff room, so much going on. They all can be regarded if you observe over time. They can be regarded as expensive learning. So to be more conceptually powerful or useful, we use third space in which a higher level of meanings, understandings made above two spaces of interaction, two people interacting, there will be third space created. So the third space, we hear we will see new meanings are formed to go beyond the evident limits of both worlds, both interacting worlds. So we take this search space as formed or in the forming when boundary crossing leads to connection and coordination of different understandings to form new and more enriched powerful understandings. We found such spaces, search spaces, they can be as small as recurring instantaneously, momentarily, focusing on overhearing here and club activity for the convenience of our analysis. Teacher M in the interview on that day shared, you can overhear information while subject teachers meeting is undergoing or talks like what happened at the school social studies classes to know how and what is going on. Talks happen naturally when people gather. You know others from random small talks. If there are three teachers talking, you may know what they are facing, like issues in each subject. Madame M also shares, sometimes she's worried as well because she also needs to plan for the research of the whole school. She needs another space, like sometimes she goes to another space to prepare for her research meetings. Overhearing from different boundary zones of meetings and casual conversations can be viewed as a search space of gathering important information, sensitive and useful here for the teaching research head, Madame M, teacher M, in performing her role required to plan the school's teaching research, which focuses on addressing problems of each subject area like lesson study, through lesson study, research lessons. And overhearing shared by another English teacher who in another high school, we, we are now using something not from this school, but another senior high school, Ling Feng visited also uh, in another school. The date is a different date. I think I don't have a correct date. So transferred to this high school, he said, Listening to other teachers' teaching methods, educational practices, helps me to create my own classes, useful for building relationship, relax, and soften my stress by listening to them. Such overhearing or listening to other teachers and meetings or casual conversations also reflects subtle findings that a staff room has the capacity to train and develop teachers to prevent teacher isolation, to build the team spirit and enthusiasm. But this third space has a notion of de-stress, listening to voices in the ambience. Teacher Y also shared that he also always pay attention to the weekend, private weekend family conversations that your know, teachers share about the weekend family conversations like something like, you know, just to de-stress, connect. And the third space is also shared in another important role of teachers, a very important role next, in fact, to their teaching duties is the club activity, all the teachers in 
this M school share, even though they are not good at certain sports, they still need to be get, to get trained on their own to be able to uh, coach such um, club activities. And th as this is the end of the school of the term, and sports tournament, they were being held on October the first and second. You can see. Round the circle on the top picture, displayed along the entrance leading to the principal's office, and also visible to the whole staff room, is the board that displaying the two days sports tournaments results, the competition results. If you can see the zoom, the picture with their billboards, all three teams lost. So they use these words to indicate, you know, heavy losses. And for judo, you know, they have their male team won. So you can see here, both male team and female team won, big victory. So you can see here, this emotion, these are actually our emotion triggering for teacher coaches in how they feel about a very important role play as a teacher. It, there is this sense of professional identity. So we believe as outsiders, such, you know, information recognize everyone's contribution as well. So a Japanese staff room made transparent by what we examine closely. The strategic design of architectural, architecturally, use of space, artifacts, furnishings, and purposeful staff develop, deployment to achieve highest efficiency in spontaneous and timely performing of roles, duties, and tasks. Student-centric, all teacher activities, whether you are, you know, it's teaching, whether it's club activities, whether it's cleaning, you know, whether it's lunch hour, they're highly aligned with teacher activities. So they're coordinated very well for information sharing, just like Sato shared. There, obviously there is a surplus of information. So intimate connection between bodies of mind, bodies and minds, public roles and private self, teacher and student needs, and larger educational goals. This is a brief summary of Japanese staff room when it is made transparent. And interestingly, if you look at Western personality psychology, search space is spelled at something like appreciating one's own strengths and the voice amid dominant values discourses. These are search spaces as self-positioning, which may weaken binary tensions, reduce or inverse depreciation, allow for the experience of belonging and tentative suspension of the ruling discourse. Meaning, you know, when you feel devalued and left out, which most often you feel depreciation and vulnerability. You claim your own strength and a voice by just strongly positioning in your strengths. So the, you will be, you will forget the ruling discourse, which might be saying something against you make you vulnerable. Yet, in Japanese staff room, through the above interviews, self-positioning in this search space reflects efforts to absorb the dominant workplace discourse, to fit into the discourse. And there's a fear of being left out. And the actually subtle, in more recent study, used Bakhtin's notion of voices to describe staff room as many voices I heard 
including young teachers asking for senior teachers' guidance, senior teachers' responses, a place to unite, align, and organize faculty, as well as a place to negotiate controversies. When many places are heard, the staff room is given meaning through the various interactions of the voices. So there is staff room identity and culture embodied by teachers, which are made more distinct and conscious when teachers transfer to other schools in Japan every five or seven years. Just like when Ling Feng shared earlier, teacher M worked in about six or seven schools. And this is the third year in the current schools that Ling Feng visited where we studied. Meaning of the third space. Based on the above, what does expensive learning mean? So third space lays out higher level of expensive learning involving learning understanding as well as felt emotion in lived experiences and the boundary crossing between the world and discourse of self to the bigger social world and dominant discourses in negotiating one's place identity in the workplace. Even the notion of identity here is very different and it is inseparable from the culture and the social dynamics in which the teacher is situated. Here in a unique space-time interaction of Shukuin Shizu of Japan and its larger society that back for further exploring and understanding. So we situate our discussion first in our analysis of the local research literature. There is a history of Japanese staff room. In 1872, according to research, local researchers, when public education school system was set up, teachers' duties were mainly just teaching and watching students. But as time went on, actually there is a multiplication of teachers' duties. And these duties, they are actually, as Ling Feng shared earlier, so many roles. So the staff room is designed purposefully with overflowing of artifacts to facilitate these multiple functions as well. So the culture, followed by schools switching by subject-based staff room to great island situated collective, uh, to grid island seated collective general staff rooms. Researchers found, in fact, these collective great island seated collective staff room actually improve classroom and grade management and achieve common understanding among teachers. From our analysis, such common understanding and information sharing seems to be highly important since teamwork and school as a collective expects everyone to stay informed. A sense of insecurity could be felt when one is left uninformed, as I mentioned earlier. Based on Ling Feng's personal observation over the years when she studied, studies, studied work, works and lives in Japan, she shared this could be achieved through a kind of code of conduct commonly expected in the workplace of Japan. Ho lin so, ho means report, lin means connect to, and so means you talk to, which are expected in many workplaces in Japan. So all of these ex build norms and culture as well. So to end, we would like to share as researchers what we found as East Asia as a method. Because this is an exploratory journey, it's a journey of rediscovery. It takes us onto an adventure filled with diverse Road taking, putting together puzzles, taking on different lenses, and closely and repeatedly examining different forms of artifacts, taking the whole apart, 
dissecting each piece in detail, and then assembling them back again in different formats, shapes, senses, and meanings. We see patterns of connection and meanings formed by looking closely at, at over four dozens of pictures of staff room, sorting, categorizing, cross-referencing, the tedious and redundant work of an ethnographer turn out to be more often intriguing and fascinating when the emerging sense making and start making sense and surface new meanings. How do we feel? We feel ourselves aliens from another planet. I mean, this is a huge exaggeration, but a good metaphor reflecting how we feel in these days. Closely examining a space filled with symbols, images, sounds, voices that are unfamiliar. This pushes us for asking new questions about what on earth this busy one roof workplace of staff room is. It's a process made fascinating by our juxtaposing diverse formats of information, see new meanings with newly adopted perspectives, lenses, and play different roles. We feel we were artifacts. We were drafters furnishing the staff room with the architectural designs. And we see quantitative patterns mixing with qualitative data. And we become firmly grounded in data, but remain open-minded. We reposition ourselves to form new research identity. This journey to really understand East Asia from the Japanese staff room perspective in as outsiders peeking in is both liberating and educative while making us more conscious and sensitive and critical in using Western lenses and literature. On the one hand, we're grateful because we really learned so much from our Western lenses in our doctoral studies where we are prepared solidly as researchers. But at the same time, you know, we are critical. When we off these limit lenses, their limitations, we become more and more aware of the limitations in limiting us, in prohibiting us seeing the full picture of East Asian social culture practices. It gives us a liberty to pick and choose whatever comes natural and fitting to our eyes, tastes, and needs. We no longer feel the urge to come up with a set of tightening framework to direct and guide how we view our data, but rather we adopt playful, useful discovery steps. The research is no longer filled with strictures and tightened logic and reason, but it becomes spontaneous, fluid, and joyful. That's the end of our webinar talk. Thank you very much for being here with us, sharing our look from outsiders, the Japanese staff room. Thank you.